I wrote it in the middle of the pandemic. And it didn't feel right for me to write, you know, another above the line, always happy, funny novel. Though I know we needed humor during that period because it just felt like I, I needed to respect what people were going through. I needed to respect the frontline workers and the way they rushed towards the flame every day while we cowered in our, in our own little houses. John Irving said in an NPR interview, and I've heard him say it many different ways uh, over the years, he says that he writes about what he fears most and what he hopes never happens to anyone he loves. And if you read through his novels, you can see that those fears on the page. And uh, I'm such a fan of his that his voice was echoing in my brain pan. And I thought about, you know, what do I fear most? And one of the things I fear most would be uh, the unexpected premature passing of my spouse. <laughs> so the novel may seem a lot, quite autobiographical given the themes that I've touched on in this novel. But it's not. I don't write autobiography. But I was trying to figure out in my own mind, you know, how to wrestle with the death of someone really close to you. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 328 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have a conversation with Terry Follis. We talk about growing old, the loss of a loved one, the taboo topic of male friendship, and those are all elements of his latest novel, A New Season. Terry and I talk about that and so much more, and that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. If you're looking for audiobook solutions, look no further than Findaway Voices. They offer distribution options to more than 43 retail and library platforms, the only way indie authors can get their audiobooks up onto Chirp and, and direct access into Spotify. Yeah, all kinds of great distribution options from Findaway Voices. If you're looking for a narrator, you can also leverage Findaway Voices for that. So they've kind of got you covered, whether you're looking to create an audiobook, looking to distribute an audiobook, and you get to choose how you want to work with them. Now, one of the great things I love about Findaway is being able to control your prices. And I've got three titles in promo right now at various platforms via Findaway. It's part of their fourth quarter 2023 promos and those titles are already starting to do well i had three different titles in their third quarter promo that did well and i have lover's moon uh, which i co-authored with julie strauss the the romance novel in my canadian marvel series that julie and i co-authored then i also have i guess the two previous books in that series uh, a bundle of fears and frights which are fear and longing in los angeles and fright night's big city because they do cover a, a two book story arc and that's also in that feature. And Active Reader, which is a short story collection, a mini short story collection, which is basically Twilight Zone style tales about bookish places. You can get into great promos like that. You can set price features. You can get your books into Chirp, as I mentioned before, which is a fantastic platform for booking promos via book, BookBub. If, if, if only... If only I didn't trip over my tongue, but that's okay. People who don't trip over their tongues, like professional narrators, you can find them on Findaway Voices. And speaking of which, I just got the audio back from Sarah Sampino, who uh, does the voice of Gail in my Canadian Rebel ser series. So I have Scott Overton, professional narrator, who's doing the voice of Michael, and Sarah Sampino doing the voice of Gail. And that is in the co authored action back to action adventure in the canadian werewolf series hex and the city which did come out quite a while ago 
and the audiobook's going to be coming out soon because I just got those audio files and I'm going to upload the audio files to find a way and make them available everywhere to retail and library platforms and you can do the same thing too. And if you want to learn how you can leverage Findway Voices in such a way, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Okay, over on to comments from recent episodes. And thank you guys so much for your awesome comments. Just some of the comments. Um, uh, thank you to Nikki Gerlain and Big Philly 15 for the kind words over on YouTube uh, about me feeling and sounding better. <laughs> And, uh, and thanks, Philly, for looking for Emma Williams's books that uh, you commented on. Uh, and this is from uh, most notably episode 326, Rebranding and Relaunching with E.L. Williams. Uh, Beth C. Parody, who is at Mac Descendant on uh, Twitter, uh, basically said uh, in response to episode 327, uh, writing The Shadow with uh, Joanna Penn, uh, I admire the work of Mark Leslie and Joanna Penn, so this episode was a real win for me. Thank you so much, Beth. No, it was a real win for, for me, because I got to have an awesome guest like Joe on my podcast, and I got to have awesome listeners like you benefit from it, just like I benefited from it. Cool. Uh, vale Nagel over on uh, Twitter said, and he's K. Vale Nagel said, I was just listening to you two at the gym. It's great to listen to two old friends catch up. Though... I had no idea Mark had hair. Did he wear it like a mohawk or long, like Fabio? And I did respond on Twitter uh, to Vale on this one, but for anyone who's not over on that X platform, uh, I did respond that, no, I had a long hair. This was more in the style of Lethal Weapon. So Mel Gibson's character in Lethal Weapon in, in, the, in the first movie when he had that sort of mullet where he had the long, long hair in the back. So it was kind of like business up front, party in the back. Just spectacular mullet. I'll see if I can find some photos to share so you guys can can laugh at that. But of course, as as the hair over the years started to recede, like the troops at the front of my forehead started to run away, run away, um, it, it was becoming more of a skeleton, which I suppose would be on brand for me and my skeletons, but it just looked too goofy. And I'd been shaving my head since, uh, consistently since 2014, and, and that was uh, summer of 2014 when I shaved my head for the warrior dash and I had my very first date with Liz uh, we were meeting uh, for a beer and uh, and and I didn't have time to, to grow part of my hair back uh, anyways and so I was bald with a bit of a beard and and I kind of and I kept that as my lucky my lucky thing because it worked out uh, we had a really great first date second date it kind of worked out in the, in, the, in the long run so that's been my that's been my look uh, since then so yes Val I did have hair once, uh, and not just, and not just everywhere in my body except the top of my head. <laughs> so uh, over on Twitter or X uh, again, Edwin Downward, uh, regular commenter, uh, thank you, Edwin, uh, said I made a point. Uh, I make a point of really listening to the Stark Reflections podcast due to what I get out of it every week. And, and wow, that's awesome! I'm I'm so glad you get stuff out of it, Edwin. Today, Edwin says I'm reflecting on how my approach to marketing is not fear, but I understand what needs to be done. Just don't know how to do it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I got to figure out, you know, maybe maybe there's a, a, an approach or a way we can we can address that. So the approach to marketing isn't fear, which is which is important, but how to do it. Uh, you know, it needs to be done. Don't know how to do it. I'd love to have a conversation with you about this, Edmund. So maybe we can figure that out because that's kind of a cool thing to do. So so do ping me and we'll figure out a time where we can just have a chat because maybe we can maybe we can get to the bottom of that. Sometimes all you need is just uh, uh, the opinion of another writer. So uh, I, again, uh, thank you guys so much for your comments. You can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca for any episode. You can um, email me, mark at marklessly.ca. You can at me. Uh, over at Twitter. I just created a Blue Sky account as well, which actually reminds me of what Twitter used to be. <laughs> I just set up my account uh, thanks to Tao Wong, who sent me a, a Blue Sky uh, invite, and I set up my account. I haven't even uh, Blue Skyed yet. I haven't, whatever you call it, tweeted onto Blue Sky. Let's just call it tweeting since, since someone threw that term out. Uh, but yeah, um, and, and maybe if you're on Blue Sky, you can follow me there at Mark Leslie as well. Maybe we can have some conversations because I love to hear what you're thinking or reflecting on when you're listening to the podcast. And I would also like to say a huge welcome and thank you to Nikki Gerlain, the, the latest patron 
of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. Thank you, Nikki, for your patronage. Not to mention all of the recent comments that I've seen. And, and I think I see most of your comments over on YouTube, which is kind of cool. Thank you uh, for that engagement, Nikki. And thanks for joining the awesome people, all the awesome, wonderful people who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections, where for a dollar, three dollars, or five dollars a month, you get access to additional content. And I have my homework cut out for me because after the interview, there's a special bonus that I talked about uh, from last episode where someone, one of my lucky patrons, is, is going to win a copy uh, of a beautiful hardcover copy of Joanna Penn's Writing the Shadow, which I'm going to send to one of my lucky patrons. That'll be uh, later on. And of course, I still have a lot of processing to do for patrons, including some additional content from this episode, as well as the interview that's going to be coming up in next week's episode to give you guys early access to that. My goodness, so much homework for this bad little boy who, you know, has so much homework to do as it is with the Masters of Publishing program that I'm taking. Oh my God, speaking of which, it's Thursday. I have some deadlines on that. Anyways, anyways, that's it for the introductory matter. I'm going to skip the personal update except to say this coming weekend, the weekend of the 13th through the 15th, I'm going to be at the Right Women Book Fest in Maryland, D.C., and I'm so excited. Heather Brooks is the organizer for that, and so many wonderful people there. I, I'm honored that I get to spend a couple days with such amazing, wonderful people. I'll be representing Draft to Digital. I'll be there with the table on Saturday and on Sunday. I'm doing two different talks uh, about Draft to Digital and publishing wide and, and all the great things and opportunities that exist for writers. But that's it. Uh, and, 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 you know, and writing stuff is going on in the background, but I'll, I'll get into that in, in probably one of the future episodes. But that's enough of an introduction. Why don't we get into the conversation with Terry Fallis about his latest novel, a new season. Terry, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. No, no, I should say welcome back to the Stark Reflections podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It's great, always great to see you and to talk to you, and nice to be back on the podcast. Oh my God, I uh, I I have to say this. I'm gonna I'm just gonna fanboy out here. I hope I hope that doesn't <laughs> make you uncomfortable. But I I just recently finished uh, a new season, your latest novel. And I am in awe, uh, not not only the fact, let, let me just praise you for a little while here. Uh, <laughs> every <laughs> single book you've read, I've loved and, 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 and continue to love them, even though I have back backlist favorite ones, just love more and more because it's a new Terry Fallis book. And but a new season was a new type of novel for you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about just a the, the, the premise uh, of the book as well as what inspired you to? to take a new flavor, a new slant. Absolutely. And and tell me to clam up after, if I'm going on too long. Because it's no, uh, not at all. This is this is <laughs> this is but, a show about uh, you. <laughs> well a couple of things happened uh that sort of made things feel a little different. First of all, I retired from my day job that I had for 30 some odd, 35 years. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I'm no longer a communications public affairs consultant. The agency I co-founded is still operating with my name on it, and I haven't given them a thought in 18 months. Uh, <laughs> you, you haven't given them a thought, or you haven't given them any consulting work? <laughs> <laughs> well, both. Actually, I have done a couple of side things in a very discreet area that is a okay. beginning, a middle, and an end. But um, I've wanted to write full-time since, uh, well, you know, Mark, I've wanted to write full-time since my very first novel when I said, oh my gosh, this is what it feels like to, to love what you do. And right. I thought I loved my day job all that time. And turns out I only liked it very much, but I, because I, I didn't know about what it felt like to write a novel. Anyway, um, so I, I, for, as of March 1st, 2022, I have been a full-time uh, writer, which was the the realization of a dream I had for the previous 15 years, wow. which tells you how financially precarious being a writer is that it took me 15 years before I could actually re retire to write full time. But anyway, no, so no, there but that, that. that's an important aspect, right, of the, the Canadian publishing scene is you're with one of the world's largest publishers, now the Canadian branch, McClellan and Stewart of Penguin Random House, right? 
Right. And yep. a, a beautiful imprint, a beautiful publisher to work with. So you're with like one of the world's largest publisher and you do well. Um, your books are constantly, I, I know this one's been uh, ranking in the tops of the, the various bestseller lists uh, since it's uh, come out. Booksellers love you. Uh, you're obviously a great guy to come into that, which I think is an important aspect for writers to think about. And yet, despite all the success, day job. <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it's. It, I think, Mark, we both know there are very few Canadian writers. When I say Canadian writers, I probably also mean who kind of publish primarily in Canada. Right. Yeah, uh, right yeah. Because as I do, believe me, I wish I had uh, publishing deals in lots of other markets. But <laughs> I think the nature of, of, my, of my work, the humor doesn't necessarily travel very well. And... Mm. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I've got one international deal for my fourth novel in Taiwan. Really? And, yeah. And my first three novels were in, uh, were in the U.S. on distribution deals, which is kind of like they weren't even there at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so yeah, I, it's, it's very difficult. Only a few. I mean, I think Lawrence Hill is doing pretty well. Uh, and Margaret Atwood does pretty well. We, we've heard of her. Linwood Barkley's uh, probably doing okay for himself. <laughs> Linwood's doing very well, but I think much of his uh, stuff is coming from international uh, sales. But uh, but yeah, it's tough. Um, but, uh, but we don't, I mean, none of us do it for the money. Uh, you don't start writing because of the unspeakable riches it yields. Uh, it's just not, you do it because you love it. Um, right. So this was the first novel I, I was writing where I had I could focus uh, completely on writing the novel. Right. Uh, the second part was I wrote it in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, it felt it didn't feel right for me to write, uh, you know, another above the line always happy, funny novel, though I know we needed humor during that period. Right. Because it just felt like I I needed to respect what people were going through. I needed to respect the frontline workers and the way they rushed towards the flame every day while we cowered in our in our own little houses. Uh, and it didn't respect those people who lost uh, loved ones and dear friends through this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you, story, you address that head on. I, I so yeah. that and that's why uh, the story that seemed to emerge uh, was rooted in the pandemic, uh, or at least the catalyzing event of the novel, which happens off stage two and a half years or so before the novel opens, was pandemic driven. So I. I just didn't feel like I could avoid it. And instead of doing what I usually do, Mark, which is take an issue I care about and want to persuade people to think about while they enjoy a story, uh, I bend that issue to my will to create situations where humor uh, is the logical conclusion. Right. I didn't bend this story to my will with that in mind. I just let the story, I followed the story and the laughs if there are any, come where they make sense. And uh, and I, I just, I sort of cast off the shackles of humor, right. the tyranny right. of humor. When you're a humor writer, that weighs on you. Gee, I just wrote four paragraphs without a single funny line in it. I better go back and bolt something on there. And, and I just felt this one, I'm just going to follow the story. And the final point was, you know how I feel about John Irving. And John Irving uh, said in an NPR interview, and I've heard it, I'm, I've heard him say it many different ways uh, over the years. Uh, he says that he writes about what he fears most and what he hopes never happens to anyone he loves. Uh, and and if you read through his novels, you can see that those fears uh, on the page. And uh, I'm such a fan of his that his voice was echoing in my in my uh, brain pan. And I just uh, I thought about, you know, what do I fear most? And one of the things I fear most would be uh, the unexpected premature passing of my spouse. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I it's uh, the novel may seem a lot quite autobiographical, given the themes that I've touched on in this novel. But it's not. I don't write autobiography. But I was 
trying to figure out in my own mind, you know, how to wrestle with the death of someone really close to you. So. <clears throat> and I want to get into that because I have a lot of probing questions because there's like, <laughs> I know where Terry got this. So for example, Jake McMaster, I kind of suspect where you got the last name from because of your yes. alma mater. <laughs> but right. um, but let's talk about Jake McMaster because it was interesting. Uh, I know that this is a beautiful, poignant, love. I just love this novel so much, but did not have those elements of humor like Daniel Addison's narration and stuff like that. However, there was the, I call it the trademark, Terry Fallis, <laughs> self-deprecating humor of the narrator when Jake right. talks about his skills at ball hockey, <laughs> you know, like even the way he <laughs> makes goals with bouncing the bouncing the ball off his face and and yeah. and stuff. So so there was enough of that, and even uh, there were there were other just elements of oh oh it had to be the age uh, and 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 that resonated so much with myself as a, as an older person thinking, yeah, I, I still feel 35, except for, I, I love the way you did that. And you kept coming in, in classic humor, you kept coming back to it. You kept, right. Well, except for this thing, right. you know, I make noises when I get out of a chair or whatever the, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, it's, it's almost like you, you couldn't help with that uh, levity that you brought to the story. Yeah. And uh, I think that's true. And, and, and in a way, Jack McMaster is quite a bit like me uh, in that uh, I am the same age. And you will know, Mark, that I have never written a narrator my own age until now, yeah. which tells you how old I think I am. <laughs> uh, I've never written a narrator my own age. So this I, I've been it hasn't been a, it's more been tongue in cheek, my my wrestling with my own age. But I honestly can't believe that I'm 63 years old. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's still a shock. Uh, I've got a ball hockey game tonight. Uh, so when I'm out there on the ball hockey, uh, court, I don't, uh, I was going to say, I don't feel 63, but actually that's not quite true because <laughs> there are many, there are clear evidence that I am no longer 35 when I'm playing ball hockey. However, right. when you're in the, in the moment, in the play, you're just a kid. You're just yeah. playing the game you've played for your entire life. And so yeah. I, that's why you remember the section of the book where I describe ball hockey as a time machine. <laughs> because yeah. It just takes you back. Uh, but the humor, um, yeah, I am unable to, to suppress my own sense of humor. Uh, I, I think writers ought to write with their full self, if that makes sense. Right. And I know so many writers, well, maybe not so many, I, I certainly know a few outstanding writers, really great writers who write novels that I would I would not put my novels in the, on the same shelf with theirs, who are really funny when you spend time with them. And yet there's very little, if any, humor in their novels. Right. And I think, what must it be like to suppress that part of your of yourself, of your personality when you're writing and not write with your full arsenal? Uh, and I, you know, uh, so even, this is, there's a couple of gut punches in this novel, but that doesn't mean the sense of humor is not gonna, gonna come through. Cause I think I, I'm not sure I could write a novel with a character who didn't have any sense of humor. But <laughs> well, well, even even uh, even the I mean, we live in a bi bilingual, supposedly bilingual country. Right. Um, and then and you and you play on that French English thing uh, where he goes to Paris and it, it tries so hard. You, you got to love how hard he tries in the fact that and, and this happened to me when I was in Montreal years ago, uh, <laughs> trying very hard to speak French and, and didn't want anyone to speak English because I wanted to practice and learn. And everyone responded in English to me. And I was like, oh, my God, I know exactly what that's like. They're being so kind. But you're like, no, please speak French. I need yeah, Exactly. Yes. Or are they being kind or are they just, uh, oh, maybe they are being kind. But sometimes the, I, I sense from some Parisian shopkeepers that they are basically saying, you know what, your French sucks. So let's just switch to English, shall we? <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of like, you know, American English versus real English, you know, Canadian right. French versus real French. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But but the, I've had that I mean, I, I'm writing those scenes from personal experience, too, even though I'm not Jack, but I yeah. know what that feels like to to stand outside for a few minutes with your eyes closed, working through the phraseology you're going to employ to get yourself that baguette or a, a sandwich or a cafe au lait 
A cafe uh, lait and a chocolat uh, croissant. A pan of chocolat, yeah. Pan of chocolat. <laughs> exactly. And you practice and you're, okay, I've got it. And you walk in and you hope you don't blow it. But even when you do it and it it goes flawlessly, at least technically flawlessly, right, but right. your accent gives you away and they switch into English. It's a... Uh, it's discouraging, <laughs> so, which is why Callahan is the only character. And yeah. she's actually a Brit <laughs> who, uh, yeah, who yeah. responds yeah. in French. <laughs> oh, my God. Cal I want to get into Callahan's character. But let's, let's go back to the hockey for a second, <laughs> because, I mean, you're, we're, we're doing this on a Tuesday. You play uh, at ball hockey every Tuesday and have for decades. That's based on, on, on reality. And I remember having you know I've read all your books from the beginning thinking, oh, Terry, Terry must love Lagavulin scotch because I'm, I love scotch. And he's talked, but that 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 was completely fictitious, Angus drinking scotch. But then and I found out, oh, no, you scotch. I don't even drink, right? No, so you like... can't stand it. <laughs> 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 but uh, you do play ball hockey and and you play ball hockey with Jim Cuddy uh, as well. And so, so you, those are two of the elements. So the ball hockey aspect was so beautiful. And I want to get back. I want to get back to your music because of something you talked about with ball hockey that was just so moving. But I kept asking the question, oh, my God, does this mean that Jim has recorded Terry's New Year's song? Did that ever happen? Because <laughs> I, I was like, is this going to be a surprise that we are actually going to see Jim Cuddy record the song? So, oh, my gosh. Wouldn't that be amazing? I, I think it was like, I mean, of course, his voice, your, your writing. <laughs> it would be amazing. But I, uh, I love Jim. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say we're close friends, but we're, we're certainly good enough friends where I would never dream of even suggesting he might consider doing right. something like that. I just, there's no way I could even take that to him at all. Uh, no way. Uh, but yeah, I, I played in the ball hockey league for over 20 years. Jim no longer plays in it, but he played for a good 10 years while I was, or 15 years when I was in the league. And he was yeah. not always, but two or three times on my team. We often played on, even played on the same line once in a while. Oh, cool. uh, and, and he is, uh, you know, as much as he is known as, as an absolute master uh, songwriter and artist, he's also just uh, a great, just a down to earth, really good guy. Yeah. Uh, but well, he I gave used permission the... to, to, to fictionalize him. And, and I was impressed by that. I was like, wait a second, you, you fictionalized a real, a real person, a celebrity <laughs> right. into your novel. I mean, obviously you had just like, Hey Jim, is it okay? Or should I just well, modify it to James Cootie who plays right. for red? Uh, I don't know. The red, uh, another word for rodeo, maybe. For rodeo, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no, when I finished the the uh, the, uh, the manuscript, I emailed him, and I I I basically said to him, I've written this novel, and it's about this, this, and this. The only real person in it, other than the expat writers of the 1920s, yes, uh, <laughs> is you, Jim. And uh, here's the manuscript. I've highlighted the areas where you make your appearances, which, you know, he's not in it for very long or very often, right. uh, but uh, a few scenes. And, and I said, look, I'm happy. It's so easy for me to change the name and, and not have it even, you know, resemble uh, you. But I like to think I've captured Jim Cuddy in the novel as you really are or as i know you to be right uh, and i think it would be great if 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 we could have you in the novel what do you think just let me know and he emailed me 20 minutes later and and said i don't even have to read the manuscript uh i i'm quite happy with you to go ahead and and leave me in and i thought that was perhaps ill-advised on his part but but <laughs> but very kind of him uh, and that's you know that's Jim, and he's read my novels. He's yeah, he course. blurbed my Simpkin novel. And... Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the other thing too, just just you know, I mean, it reminded me of his amazing solo career that I hadn't paid much attention to. So, guess who went out and bought more of his music? Right. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I, yeah, know, I, I do I, love his stuff. <laughs> I, I, I lo obviously I love Blue Rodeo, but if I had if I could only listen to one uh, Blue Rodeo or Jim Cuddy band. Uh, I might it might be Jim Cuddy band and you know and Lindsay his longtime violinist is a friend of mine we were in choir together I had a crush on her when she was you know 15 and I was uh, 13 with my voice on the verge of changing 
in the you know in our church choir and uh, so i've known her for 50 years wow. uh, and so she anyway but you know the ball hockey is in there as a vehicle for me to examine male friendship which is one of the themes in the novel like I never, you don't really see too many books about male friendship, and and oh, okay. playing in the league for twenty years has taught me something about uh, about male friendship. Um, when you're forty three, when I joined the league, that's that's a pretty advanced age. Wait, you joined you the league at forty three? At forty three, so so twenty years ago, uh, okay. two thousand and three. Oh yeah, now twenty years ago is nineteen eighty, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly. Um, so I joined the league, and you just don't expect at the age of 43, over the course of six months, say, to become really tight and close with people you'd never met before. Right. Yeah, uh, from all in, walks in of the, life, too. Right? From all walks of life. It's a very eclectic uh, neighborhood and community and league. Uh, and, you know, the only time guys really can bear to have physical contact with one another is if you're playing on a sports field or on a hockey rink right. uh, and you score a goal, it's fine to give your teammate a hug and a slap on the helmet. Uh, but Or on the rear end, of course, right? Or on the rear end, yes. You do that but, You do that anywhere else and that's not, not apropos. Right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm lear I've learned through these guys, uh, you know, I'm, I'm much huggier now than I was before. I think you, when you and I see each other, we hug. Of course, uh, yeah. But yeah. 40 years ago, we, we probably wouldn't have. Yeah, uh, no. Yeah, we would have had to say, let's go play hockey so we can high five. So we can high five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, one of the guys, so I hug with lots of guys and now, and and it's it feels, it felt a bit strange when we first did it, and it feels totally natural now. I had one guy in the league, a very dear friend, we're going to their place for dinner on fr this Friday night, uh, and he, uh, you know, he hugs me. And then he kisses me on the cheek. And I think, wow, it, that felt very odd the first time it happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, to feel his whiskers <laughs> on your cheek. But now I'm quite used to it and it, yeah. quite comfortable with it. And I think and, that's. And in that's Europe, progress. you see it all the time. You see friends yeah. just doing yeah. that in general, both cheeks right. usually. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So oh. that I think that's progress for men, representing men. Uh, and yeah. I think we should do more of that. So. And and I love I know you're a feminist uh, and I've loved that theme throughout many of your novels and that you you bring it into this novel in a very subtle way that may I, not scare off <laughs> some people <laughs> yeah. but um but I but I love that about it but let let's go back so okay and I and sure. I, I got to get into this so your music sure. uh, and I know you're also a musician you and your brother have have played uh, for a long time but you brought that into this novel in such a beautiful way. Um, especially uh, numerous ways and numerous songs, but let's talk about the more than more than a game. More I mean, the song game. which is your your ode to ball hockey. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I wrote it about fifteen years ago, uh, and you should know that I, you know, I'm I'm a very uh, closeted singer songwriter. Yes, uh, I, you know, I'm. I'm Less quite, closeted I'm... with this novel now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it it's it was uncomfortable for me, but you know I I know a lot about songwriting. I've been writing songs since I was seventeen years old, uh, and I, I'm not suggesting for an instant that many of them, if any of them, are particularly good. But it was it's a fulfilling hobby and passion for me. Uh, but it usually happens right in this room. I have a twelve string and a six string or a guitar right over there. Um, mm -hmm. So I wrote this song uh, because of how I felt about the ball hockey league and the people in it and the community that has sprung up around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it's called more than the game. And, you know, the, the bridge in the song probably captures the sentiment most clearly when it says, you know, uh, when the season finally ends, what rewards have we reaped? Look around and count your friends. That's the score we keep. Mm. Like the, the, the games, I, I can I, I sometimes forget whether we won or lost the night after the day after because that's not really what's important. And yeah. most, perhaps not all, but most of the guys feel the same way about the league. So it's so that was a, a fun a fun song to write. Um, 
uh, I think of it actually as a love song to the to the league. Uh, it, it really it, is. It, 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 that's how it felt. It was a love song, and and I love the way you introduce it with your character being in the closet. <laughs> You're just gonna <laughs> play. So, um, oh, okay. Um, before I get on to other questions about the music, because there's another beautiful uh, song in there that's central, is the you. Uh, well, I have to ask this first. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of three questions kind of hit me at once. I'm like, okay, push one aside and just ask this question. <laughs> but uh, have you brought the guitar to any of the book signings? Because I bet you someone's in the room's going to. Could you just sing a little bit of this? Have you done that? Uh, it, it's a very good question. Uh, it has not happened yet. It will be happening happening on November the second. Oh, uh, in at the Book Drunkard Festival in Uxbridge. Oh, uh, and I'm I'm being interviewed on stage by a fellow author and ball player in the ball hockey league who is also a professional musician. Oh. And his name's Mike Tanner. He's a great guy. I've known him for years. Uh, and, uh, he's very thoughtful and erudite and, uh, and he plays guitar and sings very well. We're going to do the songs together. Uh, the first time I will have done them live. Uh, and so what has happened in the events I've been doing so far is that I, I have a nice, uh, Bose, uh, Bluetooth speaker and we have the studio recordings that I, I did of the songs that were mixed and mastered by a real professional recording engineer who makes me sound better than I probably will ever sound live. So I have, upon request, played, uh, I've so far, I, I guess I've played both songs at one, but usually I've just played the second song until the new year, which uh, we haven't talked about yet, but uh uh, and it's it's really awkward to sit at the front of the room for three and a half minutes while this song is playing. And I'm just <laughs> sitting there because, you know, because only a handful of people have heard either of those songs over yeah. the years. Right. Only right. a handful. So, <laughs> wow. And that's uh, such a shame uh, because they're, they're both uh, beautiful songs. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm really excited that as a creator, you've now been able to bring because because remember you know 15 plus years ago when you thought my hey i've got the satirical novel of canadian politics i'm just going to write it and see what put it out there myself and see what happens goes and wins a leacock award canada reads all the things happen uh beverly uh agent picks you up um yeah ironically a, a good friend of yours doug gibson said Terry, why didn't you tell me you were writing a book? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, all these things. But then all of a sudden, there's this closeted writer who came out. And then there's mm -hmm. this closeted uh, musician who's who's now come out in, in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Because I was so excited. I, I, I always buy your books so I can get nice signed copies. But I al also listen and I purchase uh, the um, audio uh, as well because I love your narration of the books and I got like oh my god this is so phenomenal we're going to hear the song now um, yeah and that's uh, Penguin Random House they don't know that that's ever happened before in, in an audio book that the author yeah. has original music that uh, is laid into the uh, yeah. to the audio book uh, I mean it may have happened but it's certainly rare and it's it's that was kind of an interesting innovation that <laughs> they suggested and I you know swallowed my anxiety and terror and uh uh you know uh self-doubt and and we we did it and my son we did the recording in the house here we have a pretty good recording setup and my son is a is a rec budding recording engineer as well has trained in it yeah. but he didn't feel comfortable doing the mixing and mastering so we sent that to another producer who's produced my my son's bands and uh so anyway I, it was uh it was fun and uh yeah it it does sound better than I usually do, which is why I, I would usually rather play the recording than than yeah. deal with the demons of standing live and doing it and croaking <laughs> out the song. But <laughs> there is an element in the scene uh, where where Jack is called uh, on stage to, to to perform, and 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 it reminded me of your response to winning the Leacock Award about making jokes about having a having a coronary right there on the spot <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. nervousness right yeah um, 
Yes. <laughs> uh, will the will the will the songs or are the songs available outside of the book? Like, if I go on Spotify, will I be able to just add them to my 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 you know lists that I listen to when I'm in the house? That's a, you know that's a really good question, and the short answer is no, not yet. Beyond they're on they're on my Substack. I did put them in oh, one okay. of my so Substack. Oh, okay. So I can go to posts. Substack and listen. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's one. Uh, I forget which post it is, but it's it's there. Uh, both of the studio recordings are there. Um, but I hadn't thought about uh, 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 Spotify, but it occurs to me that we have this. It's a very it's a very primitive recording in that it's just guitar and voice. Yeah. Uh, it may be that we might take that as a route and try and build, layer on uh, some more instruments and, yeah. uh, and and make it more of a fully arranged version. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen, uh, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind hearing it with something other than just my guitar and my voice right. I see. like my son playing bass I, I have my younger son who's an outstanding singer uh do some harmonies uh, maybe my brother is a great piano player so there may we may do that but the reason we didn't do it for the the audiobook is that that's not how it happens in the audiobook it's just yeah Jack playing a guitar, so that's yeah, why which is we beautiful. Did. Yeah, he's playing the guitar. Okay, so let's and let's talk about the other love song, the love love song, um, <laughs> right. and that that's got it. I believe that was based on on you actually writing a love letter to your beloved. Yeah, it uh, <laughs> that song's forty two years old. Wow, uh, I was at McMaster, uh, my engineering uh, doing my engineering degree at the time, and I was very involved with student politics and had been campaigning in a, a women's residence for uh, uh, probably a Canadian Federation of Students referendum. I don't actually remember what it was. And uh, this woman opened the door. And uh, so it was pretty much as close as you can get to sort of love at first sight, at least for me. I, I suspect it took her a little longer. but uh, <laughs> uh, And she invited me back to a, a floor party that night so I, I did, and it was, it was early in the evening already, I ditched the rest of my leaflets without completing the residence and went back to the party. And we started seeing each other and I fell very hard. This was late in the fall of 1981. Yeah. And uh, when exams, Christmas exams came around, she, had, she finished early and she went home to Nova Scotia where she lived. And as students do over the Christmas break, and I, I still had an exam or two to do, and I, I had fallen pretty hard, and I was really feeling her absence. And I remember sitting in my on-campus apartment on my little single bed late at night, uh, not being able to sleep, looking out the window. I could see the moon and clouds going across it, and I had these Christmas lights strung up in my window. And sometimes lyrics are staring you in the face. And there's a lyric in the song, uh, as winter clouds surround the moon and colored lights frame my thoughts of you. Because I could see my reflection in the window looking back at me. Uh, so yeah, so it's a novel about this woman that I was, uh, who I was seeing at the time. Uh, and uh, it's called Until the New Year, because that's when she would come back. It's a Christmas song. Right, uh, right. And uh, the the happy ending of that song is that uh, next month we'll be celebrating our 36th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> that's amazing. So I, it's, it's written about the woman I ended up uh, marrying. So. so how did she feel about that? Because there's a song you obviously sang for her and then maybe have yeah. sung in very close limited quarters and then suddenly this 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 love you have for her is now being shared broadcast yeah. how does how, how is she with that she has to share this now with the world that's right it's a little bit well it was awkward because uh i mean not only has i mean none of my songs have had that kind of exposure before right. you know close circles of friends dinner parties late at night uh, yeah. fire crackling bring out your guitar, Tara, would you? And uh, it's never my suggestion. <laughs> but So, I, I mean, maybe a few people have heard that. My family, like my brothers heard it. And, uh, but uh, so I asked her uh, and, and she was, uh, she was okay with it. Uh, I, I think, you know, if the love story in, in the novel uh, 
hadn't ended up well. May, I don't know whether she, how she would have felt about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, but she was uh, she was accommodating. In fact, she was in. I did my um, Toronto International Festival of Authors event yesterday, two days ago on Sunday, uh, and she was in in the audience, and and we ended up playing the song there. So she was listening to it with along with all the other people in the room. <laughs> so it's just a bit surreal to have something that is so proud. I, I would sing it to her on Christmas Eve, uh, late at night on Christmas Eve, every, you know, every year, every year until we had kids and life kind of <laughs> overtook us. Now, Switched the over to the night of, before Christmas to read to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> which we still do together as a family, by the way. But yeah, but that, that sort of tradition of just the two of us playing it, uh, me playing it to her as a, uh, as you know a, a romantic tradition that's kind of fa fallen by the boards but uh but the thought is there <laughs> i love that see i think of that it is a, a, a beautiful christmas song but it's a subtle christmas song because it's more about the relationship than about whatever right. i think of uh, the first time i heard megan smith's uh it snowed which mm. is a now considered a christmas classic or a christmas song right but it's not about christmas it's just about the season Right, right. <laughs> and it's about yeah. being with someone that you love. I mean, and appreciate right. spending time with them. Let's play hooky because it snowed last night. That kind of thing. Right. And this new year is this beautiful. Again, it comes back to almost like this universal. We're away from one another, but we'll get together. Right. There's something to look right. forward to. So I love. I look forward to this. This being on the airways every year. <laughs> yeah, isn't that, isn't that nice? That's a well. I think it, if it's ever, if that's ever going to happen, there needs to be a couple of jingle bells in there somewhere, and some <laughs> other thing to make it happen. But uh, yeah. anyway, it's you know, I don't, I don't love or even like all of the songs that I have written. I have forgotten many of the songs that right. that I have written, uh, but there are a few that kind of keep cycling through my my mental playlist, which means I. Uh, I like them. And so that's, uh, those are the two songs in, in the novel are two songs that uh, are probably better than many of the other songs I've written. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's get to the character of Callahan, who I just, I adored Callahan um, yeah. in so many ways, but Callahan obviously comes back to 1920s Paris. And I have to ask, is that, and, 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 and you did, go to Paris, at least in, I think it was in no relation. You at least right. had your character go. Is there a passion for 1920s Paris? Is Morley Callahan one of one of those writers that you've enjoyed? Yeah, for for years, I've uh, I've sort of been obsessed with uh, with Paris in the 1920s. It probably coincided. I, I was always interested, but when I became a writer relatively late in life, uh, all of a sudden, Paris in the 1920s took on more significance uh, for me. And uh, my reading about that era and that place, that city, uh, stepped up. Uh, and I've got bookshelves filled uh, with uh, books. I mean, I have a first edition. I'm looking at a first edition of Morley Callahan's That Summer in Paris uh, over there now. And uh, yeah, I, I have tons of books on that. Well, you can do you see this map? Paris? This is a 1928 map of Paris. Uh, <laughs> street map of Paris. So wow. uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and obviously you have spent uh time there uh, because yeah. of that passion, right? Yeah, Nancy and I go to Paris uh for the last decade or so, or 15 years, maybe we've gone every second year and we stay uh we only ever stay on the left bank and, and generally the same hotel. Uh yeah. and we occasionally will venture over to the right bank, uh, but we feel most at home in our neighborhood on the left bank, which is oh, yeah. you know a block and a half from Le Dumago, uh, where Hemingway would often write, and uh, it's a, a a walk, a long walk, but a, not a, not too bad to Montparnasse and to the Select Bistro and Le Dome and all of the places I write about in the novel. So we're, we're kind of right in that same area. And the thing about Paris, which I also talk about in the novel, Paris is a time machine uh, yes. because yeah. all of those places are, are still there. They have changed very little. The cars and the fashions have changed, but the architecture, the buildings, the cafes, like they don't even, like they, they keep the cafes well tended and, and the upkeep yeah. is maintained, but if you walked into 
uh, Le Deux Magot or Le Select Bistro, they don't look any different than they did then. The counter you're leaning on is the same counter from 1920. Uh, so it's it's freaky and powerful for uh, a writer who loves that period to to be in those places. So have you written in any of those cafes? Oh yeah. Well, you mentioned no relation. Uh, the scene there's a, a a couple of scenes in Paris. One of them uh, set in Les Deux Magots. Uh, this famous cafe that, that Hemingway particularly enjoyed. In fact, they have a photograph of him above his favorite seat mm -hmm. to this day. And I wrote that scene sitting in Hemingway's favorite seat in Les Deux Magots. Uh, oh, yes. So and, and Hemingway, of... obviously, a very important uh, element of, uh, of no relation. <laughs> so yes, <that>. exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know that I'm not, I don't like Hemingway as a writer, let alone as a person. <laughs> but <laughs> one cannot question his, uh, what a Goliath he was yeah, striding yeah. across the literary landscape in the 1920s. He reshaped literature, wow. perhaps not single-handedly, but he was probably the one who had the greatest influence on the, the shift in, in prose from right. flowing right. Uh, labyrinthine <laughs> mellifluous prose from the Victorian age into the, the modernist age where it's all stripped and pared down and much of it is beneath the surface where we just have to infer it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as you know, I hail from the why use six words when 12 will do school of writing. <laughs> I like to splash around in the language. Uh, I don't want to write. I don't, I don't want a five-year-old to be able to read my novel. <laughs> I love that you you referenced that in this novel, but uh, Daniel Addison also used a very similar phrase. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like an yeah. Easter egg for us longtime <laughs> yeah, fans. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so so <laughs> looking at uh, 1920s and looking at influential figures and, and, and considering the, the, the journals of Callahan's uh, grandmother, Right. You also held up in high regard another figure from that era, uh, female, actually. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want to give away spoilers or anything like that, but yeah. We won't give it away, but uh, yeah, I, it's it, it was um, serendipitous that that character also played a role in the 1920s in Paris and sprang upon on the scene and became somebody particularly well-known. Uh, I had really had fun with that. It, it's funny, Mark, when I was writing the novel, I felt like I was I was missing an element of that I it wasn't I needed something else to round out the story. Right. And right. and uh, the saga of Constance Stanley's diaries, Callahan's grandmother, and you know, the mysterious way that particular volume of the diaries was uh, eventually discovered. Uh, and what happened to the diaries thereafter and who they, at least, you know, which prominent character was captured in, in a portion of those diaries. That, that was the, that was the final piece that I, I felt I needed to complete uh, the story. Uh, and I had, a, I had a lot of fun, uh, fun with that. And it was particularly fun for me, my knowing my penchant for uh, old school writing to, to write the diary, a few diary entries on Constance's behalf. Right? Uh, and, and, and I love the way the voice just very specifically changed. And it was kind of this real. Yeah. So I was like, is this, is this a real diary it's based on? Or is this completely right. fictitious? <laughs> yeah, completely fictitious. But it did allow me, it gave me a, an interesting vehicle for exploring, talking about some of the expat writers at the time, uh, Ezra well. Pound and, and Hemingway and based Callahan on all and, of the all of the memoirs you've read from that era too, right? Right. So, um, right. Okay. Um yeah that that was absolutely fantastic. Um I mean I love how it added this element of mystery and intrigue and this whole <laughs> other subplot which was which was really in uh I, I love that uh, aspect of the novel. So uh sort of get as we as we get close to the end um you love uh, plays on words. You love when things mean more than one thing. And so when you think about the title, A New Season, right. it refers to so many things. Yeah. Can you talk yeah, a little I, bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, it, it, you're right. I, I have enjoyed coming up with titles for my earlier novels. Uh, not all of them this 
principle applies, but for many of them, there are more than one meaning. Yeah. Uh, and the the different meanings, sometimes more than two, become clear as you read the novel. Uh, mm-hmm. And also, if it's if it's a bit cryptic, if the if the title is a bit cryptic before you start to read the novel, it's something else that's kind of looming over the story. And oh, I now I see why it's called that. And in this case, yeah, definitely a new season. Uh, you know, he he goes to Paris for five months and he has to go back to Toronto in time for a new season, applying to the uh, applying to the ball hockey league. Yeah. Uh, it's a new season in his life. Uh, he was he was uh, unexpectedly widowed um, before the novel opens and he's still wrestling with that. So it's a new season in his life. Uh, and then, you know, when he, he meets Callahan and thus begun begins another new season Uh, so it it, it comes up a few times it's probably among the more banal titles that I I I have ever come up with but that doesn't mean it isn't meaningful it's just the the phrase itself is kind of pedestrian a new season Uh, there's no real shock in that but I hope it takes on meaning and poignance uh, and other qualities as you read the novel for sure it really really does Uh, and because I always look for that uh, in in a novel is why did the author (laughs) go with this title and and then I found all those layers and went oh yeah this is amazing all right so you are (laughs) You are now retired from the PR uh, work that you did uh, full time. This was something that you wrote over the uh, pandemic. You're still writing and and playing for for fun and 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 just pure pleasure of uh, your own music uh, as right. well. What I not, not not what's next, but I'm assuming you've already begun work on on the that, the next book. And 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 can can you without giving anything away, of course, yeah. can you give us an idea of where you're going with this one. Yeah, I can't. And I, I sort of had this idea before the the story in a new season was fully formed, before I realized it was going to be as much of a departure as uh, it turned out to be, I think. Uh, so the, the, the new novel, I think it's going to be called The Marionette. Uh, and it's the story, in a way, of, a, of an aging thriller writer, Canadian thriller writer, who finds himself playing the role that he often writes about in in some clandestine operations with the support of CSIS uh, and a particular, a young woman CSIS agent who serves as his, uh, or masquerades as his research assistant when they go into, uh, it's an African country that is very unstable and there's been a coup d'etat there and there is a canadian mining company there and the mining industry has been nationalized and they are being held in a compound and aren't being allowed to go because they need to run the mine that's now you know been been nationalized uh and uh, he this aging thriller writer gets the job of of helping them get out of the country and he's the perfect person for it because when the dictator, who turns out to be a marionette and not the real power, he's just, you know, kind of innocent, actually, but he's the face of the coup. He, um, in his first news conference from the palace, uh, the bookshelves behind him feature every single one of this thriller writer's books. Oh. And this dictator is a huge fan of this guy. Uh, and when the novel opens, the thriller writer is in trouble in a different country, a former Eastern Bloc country where he's gone to do research. He was taking pictures and and he's being interrogated. And the interrogation is about to go from verbal interrogation to the next level. Uh, electricity might even be involved. And finally, he before any of that happens, the Canadian embassy official arrives to save him. He's, they're driven straight to the tarmac. He's kicked out of the country and it's a government, a Canadian government plane and sitting on the plane is one Angus McClintock. It, it's not an Angus novel per se. It's not. But that's an Easter uh, egg for readers, right? <laughs> he makes a cameo because he's now the minister of public safety responsible for CSIS. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he's trying to figure out how can he get this the the these Canadians out of the country, not unlike you know Ken Taylor got them out of uh, Tehran all those years ago. So anyway, it, it's uh, there's more to the story than that, but that's it's not fully formed. I'm just right. giving you the the broad strokes. Oh, this is uh, this is such a treat. Thank you. I, and and it reminds me because uh, previous to a new season, the two previous novels had quite yeah. a bit of suspense and intrigue, mm. and and that that's where you could see as a writer that you were wanting to play in that realm a little bit more yeah. which is kind of cool yeah that's that's exactly it uh but having just written a novel that has a bit more emotional depth perhaps than than my other novels and and given how uh surprisingly to me how people seem to be taken with this this new novel um it makes me a little less certain about this new one that i've been sort of <laughs> noodling around in my head but anyway uh it should be fun and i've got time to to explore it and yeah some there may be some elements in the story that are not yet clear to me but uh well, that's sort of the you know the the overview well i mean but but again as as a as a die hard you know buy at first sight kind of fan of yours and and many <laughs> of us are whatever way you take it we're gonna love it i, I i'm pretty sure <laughs> of that. I, I have I have, com you. I have confidence when i heard this guy that reminded me of robertson davies meets john irving way back when <laughs> is the way i described when i first we first started reading you and i'm like well hey cool i'm gonna like this i think <laughs> well mark you have always been so supportive and if i could i would have you attend every one of my readings to introduce me <laughs> <laughs> so I get the phrase. So uh, what, one last what, one last bit is uh, any advice for uh, you know you didn't start uh, writing you didn't you didn't release your music into the world or your writing into the world until later in in mm -hmm. life. Any advice for writers who are wanting to do it but are just like a little bit oh no I I can't do this I can't I can't come out of the writing closet. Well, I think the advice well. The advice is is easy to say and harder to honor, uh, but the advice would be uh, you have to get over that. You have to you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone and have some faith in in your art. Uh, and it goes back to other advice I often give to writers, which is write about something that you really care about. Uh, if you're going to commit months and months and months to writing uh, writing a novel or a, a book of some kind. Uh, you want to be, you want to enjoy that that experience by writing about something that you care about uh, and are passionate about, as opposed to sticking your marketing finger in in the wind and what's hot these days. Oh well, I've said used the example before. Remember when vampire novels were all the rage, and you would know about that because, uh, but you. You love that stuff. You care about that stuff. You weren't doing that for marketing reasons. You would have done that if vampires had never become in vogue in literature. Yeah, yeah. But if someone is writing just because they're trying to catch the coattails of a trend going by, a trend uh, to which they have no real personal connection, I can't imagine the book's going to be as good as it can be. Better to write about something that may not be in vogue, but you really care about uh, and I think that will help you uh, push it out there because it's more meaningful to you and uh, you care about it. And you want something, you want a certain, maybe you want changes. Think about my, my first two novels where I was not happy with the way we were practicing politics in this country, even though it was how I earned my living in the early part of my career. So I cared about that. And no one in their right mind, as you know, Mark, would ever tell someone if they wanted to be published to write a satirical novel of Canadian politics, right? Yes. But I mean, that turned out well, and maybe it did because I really cared about what I was writing. So <laughs> I love that. Fantastic advice. So uh, uh, Tara, where can people find out more about you online? Uh, the, my website, terryfollis.com. I have a, a sub stack, a, a news, it's called a newsletter. It's not really a newsletter. It's whatever I'm writing about musings about the writing life, the background of my earlier novels, writers I've encountered and what they're like, my favorite authors, uh, the writing craft, uh, travels. Uh, and uh, that comes out every Sunday, every second Sunday morning. Uh, and you can subscribe to it. It's free. Uh, you can subscribe to it 
uh, on the bottom of my homepage. Scroll down to the bottom and there's a little place where you can see some of the posts and you can just give me your email address and, and you can subscribe. And I've had fun doing that. I hope they're they're funny and interesting and there's lots of photos. Uh, I can't write as much as it allows you to write. So I put lots of photos in uh, <laughs> of you know my travels and, and it's uh, I have fun with it. So. Well, I will make sure there are links to all those things, including previous interviews with you and links to your music, et cetera, over at starkreflections.ca. Terry, again, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Mark, it's always a pleasure. You know that. Anytime, anytime. You were there right at the very beginning for me. You organized my very first book launch when I didn't know what a book launch was. <laughs> uh, so we go back to the very beginning. So and, and and I keep holding that over your head saying you have to remain friends with me, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> there's no holding it over my 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 head. That's the uh, I've enjoyed our, all of our times together, and I know there'll be more. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Terry, and I, I guess I'll see you on the bestseller list. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> oh, always so many things to reflect on whenever I talk to Terry, and and it's just so awesome to see somebody who's so passionate, who's worked so hard, and enjoys what he's doing find success i just love seeing the the photos he's sharing and you can see lots of them if you if you follow him on on substack and it's terryfollis.substack.com but of course i'll have links to terry's website and substack etc in the show notes at starkreflections.ca but speaking of speaking of that i want to reflect on that bit of advice that that terry shares about writing about something that you care about or are passionate about and and he's done that. He's written about many things he's passionate about or, or thinking a lot about, obviously, as he talks about this novel that was born out of the of the pandemic and the fears and stuff like that. And it ties in so beautifully, doesn't it, to last episode or the between episode, that extra bonus episode I snuck in uh, this the, earlier this week, 327, writing The Shadow with Joanna Penn, focusing on The Shadow. And, and, and again, I've heard offline from several folks who had shared with me how impactful that conversation was because, you know, Joe talks about not letting, uh, not letting the things that you normally repress uh, stop you from being authentic and writing. And, and Terry's got very similar advice, and I love how it complements one another about writing about something that you're passionate about. That's been so beneficial to me that the Canadian werewolf novels are not burning up the bestseller charts and they're not bringing in six figures uh, worth of money for me, but I'm having so much fun writing them. And the right readers seem to be having a lot of fun reading them. And and that's kind of cool. Even when I think about the Canadian Mounted, my, my book of trivia about planes, trains, and automobiles, I honestly did not expect that to sell. I expected a handful of nerds like me to say, hey, that's cool, ha ha ha, that's neat, I'll probably buy that. I did not expect to sell the thousands and thousands of copies of that that have moved because, you know, it was it was, it was was passion. It was written out of my love for that John Hughes movie and, 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 and the way that Steve Martin and John Candy interact uh, in that movie. All of the, like everything having to do with it, of course. And so... I've, I'm trying to make space to write more of the things that I'm really passionate about. So yeah, I followed up the Canadian Mounted with the uh, Yippie Kaye, the trivia book of Die Hard, and and I have other books like that in the works that are just pure passion projects and a lot of fun to put together. But so too, as I approach my fiction, am I approaching it with that spirit? that Terry suggests of writing something that I care about or that I'm passionate about because you never know if it's going to sell or not. <laughs> but even if it doesn't sell, even if it doesn't sell, you at least enjoyed the process. You enjoyed the journey of creating it. And when the right readers pick it up, they will benefit from that. So some great things to reflect on. And again, I love how how the message from the last episode and from this episode, uh, tie in so beautifully. But speaking of the last episode, I did promise, uh, as I as I supported Joanna Penn's Kickstarter, Writing the Shadow, 
I, uh, I put in an add-on for an additional beautiful hardcover edition of Writing the Shadow. Turn your inner darkness into words. Mind Joanna Penn. And I ordered an extra copy of that. And as I said, I would do a random drawing for my patrons. So what I did is I exported uh, the list of active patrons. And I basically put, if you were a $1 a month um, a patron, you got one entry. And if you're $3 a month, you got... Um, two entries and if you're five dollar months you got three entries and so I basically put that into a spreadsheet randomly sorted it through numbers associated with it went to random.org picked a random number and the random number came up and it was associated with the account belonging to Kathy Mack congratulations Kathy you are the winner of writing the shadow by Joanna Penn gorgeous beautiful early edition hardcover that's only coming to patrons first haha <laughs> so you get access to that and congrats, uh, Kathy, and, and thank you, Kathy, and thanks to everyone who supports the podcast over at Patreon. I, I do want to do these extra bonuses just as a special thank you to my patrons and in the hopes that you're getting additional bonus out of your support for me. But Kathy, I'll be reaching out directly to you just to confirm where I'm going to ship the book when it arrives, and thank you for your patronage. But that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. And just a reminder, the music bits from uh, that Terry and I talked about that appear in the audiobook, which I highly recommend you check out, I'm going to have a sample of, uh, of them after the bumper, after the closing bumper, so those who want to enjoy the music can stick around for that. And a huge thank you to Terry for allowing me <laughs> to play that. But as always, I want to thank you, dear listeners, so much for listening to the podcast. I love to hear your reflections. You can always leave your comments over at starkreflections.ca or those other ways on social media that you can tag me. But knowing that you're there, knowing that you are reflecting and learning and benefiting from this podcast means the world to me. And thanks for letting me into your ears, your mind, maybe your heart, maybe your reflections in some way every week. I love being there. I love that you are there with me too. Because, you know, I'd still be there anyways because I'm, I'm kind of passionate about it. But... Until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Hello, post and credit listener. I just wanted to introduce the song More Than the Game by Terry Fallis. And uh, I'm not sure why this song speaks to me. Maybe because I'm, I'm of an older age. Maybe because I grew up in northern Ontario playing hockey. Maybe because more than... The game maybe reminds me of, of sometimes the beers that I have with the cherished people where I get to enjoy a beer with them because it's more than more than the beer. But in any case, here's Terry's beautiful song, More Than the Game. trees and the falling leaves in the dark of night aging teams still live their dreams underneath the lights when the game begins i go breaking in i'm almost in the clear so I fire a shot that the goalie stops His teammates stand and cheer Although it's rare when tempers flare Still everyone plays hard And in the end we're all still friends As we head up to the bar Though my knees are sore and my hands won't score My head is pounding in pain the will is strong, but the legs are gone. Every week 
it's the same It's so much more than the game Oh, much more than the game When your game is done, whether lost or won You hate to leave the park so you stay to the end and heckle your friends whenever they miss the mark. But we all know when the whistle blows and it's time to pack it in. That it won't be long till the week is gone and the game is on again. When the season finally gone every week it's the same oh my knees are sore and my hands won't score my head is pounding in pain the will is strong but the legs are gone every week it's the same it's so much more than the game it's so much more than the game, much more than the game.